All right, so welcome back into the live stream today. We're gonna to be breaking down stablecoin regulation. This looks like it might be the first step in a regulatory environment around crypto. This could really bring a lot of things our way in terms of adoption, a lot of things in terms of price movement, and I think uh, quite a bit more in terms of projects. We'll dive in deep. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back into Tech Path. Let's get into it today. Of course, some of the news hitting the crypto webs is all about stablecoins, and it's really diving into some scenarios that will play out in some interesting ways. Now, it's not all verified just yet. This is coming over, of course, from uh, a, a great media source, I think. Uh, and I think there are some indicators there that definitely point in the right direction. Direction. Before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsor, and that is iTrust Capital. If you're looking at long-term holding, which is one of the things I do often, this is one of the best ways to do it, and that is through a crypto IRA. Uh, one of the things you can be uh, looking at with iTrust is in the essence of actually trading within the account. This is fully functional within iTrust, very easy to do. Go to their website. They've got staking now available, uh, which is, I was kind of blinded by that uh, and was really surprised. So that in itself is really great. Uh, lots of new changes out there, over $6 billion in transactions, 175,000 accounts. Uh, this is definitely one of those that's going to stay around and um, be one of what I think will be one of the leading crypto IRAs out there for sure. A lot of tokens available as well on there. If you guys do want to get into this and you're getting ready for maybe your tax prep, uh, IRAs are one of the ways to start to really use all the tax benefits that you can around IRAs. So take a look at our link below. Once you open an account, you will get a $100 funding reward, but you can also open an account without even funding it and just getting information and start the process of understanding how to get involved in crypto IRAs. Let's get into it today, and that is stablecoin regulation. Now, this is coming over from Bloomberg, and basically what uh, they're stating here is uh, that the House stablecoin bill would put two, a two-year ban on Terra-like coins, in other words, algorithmic coins, if you look down in the first few uh, paragraphs of the article is really kind of the, the breakdown here. Regulating st uh, stable coins that obviously being drafted right now in the House would pay, place a two-year ban on uh, algorithmic. Uh, also under the latest re uh, version of the bill, it would also be illegal to issue or create new indigenously collateralized stable point coins. So according to, uh, this was a copy obtained by Bloomberg, definition would kick in for Stablecoins marketed as able to be converted, redeemed, or repurchased for a fixed amount of monetary value. That relies solely on uh, the value of other digital assets. So I, I think that the overall structure of how they're trying to formulate this, and this is something we've known about for quite some time. We've looked at Toomey's draft. We've also seen some of the stuff from uh, Gillibrand and, and um, the other senator. Um, one of the things that I think when we look at stablecoins is how, when this regulation comes through is how real, how will this affect the traditional markets, but more importantly, the banking markets. And there's quite a few uh, things that kind of point in this direction for sure. One of the things that I was looking at is the, uh, the overall assets on stable coins. If you look at market cap right here, and just let's, we'll kind of zoom in on this a little bit for you guys. Uh, USDC coming in right there, uh, market cap five bill, uh, 50 bill, sorry. Um, Staking market cap, five bill. And then you've got DAI coming in, Tether coming in at 67 on market cap, uh, but lower on staking. And I'm kind of curious, are you guys staking or um, utilizing USDC or other stable coins in ways that maybe you would typically use a savings account? Love to kind of get your feedback on that, uh, of how you're using stable coins. Or are you just parking um, that dollars into that as opposed to holding dollars in the bank? Kind of curious of how you guys are going. And then you got True USD coming in, Binance USD, which I think this one is really going to be climbing the charts. 20 billion in market cap and only 65 million in stake. I think this is going to be coming uh, up the charts quickly. I do believe that what CZ is trying to do in terms of where Binance is going with BUSD, this is going to be a big one for sure. Paxos, of course, standard uh, is in there. USDN coming in, uh, Gemini Dollar, um, and then uh, Stasis and, and Fay. So when you look at the growth curves of these stable coins, uh, USDC has been a little bit starting to uh, falter slightly. I think some of this is coming from the world stage right now, especially from the aspect of where Binance and even Wazirex, uh, who recently 
uh, also went this direction. But the scenario that I'm looking at is how much institutional adoption will we start seeing uh, going into this area? Now, one of the guys that is a big proponent of this is Kevin O'Leary. This was a tweet coming over from uh, Kevin O'Leary. And uh, let me play this clip real quick because it's a short clip, two minutes, but we'll kind of skip through a couple of points. But I want you to listen into what he has to say. Really want to have happen is I want the regulators to bring policy forward on stable coins. That's what I want. I want because stable coins are very important to me as a hedge against inflation. And specifically, the one I've chosen to work with is USDC because I think it's the most advanced in terms of in dialogue with the regulator, not here, but in geographies all around the world. It, it, it's a form of payment. It's also a form of, of hedging against uh, inflation because if I can at least marry my staking program with inflation currently at 6%, at least I'm holding value. But I can't really do that until the regulator rules because even within my own port operating company with my own compliance department, they're considering uh, stable coins as an equity, no different than a stock. So I really can't get past 5%. It's not like I can hold a huge 30% cash position. I mean, you know, when we sold off our commercial real estate, we had a huge cash position. We couldn't, it was 30% of the operating company. So, you know, we've been working hard to redeploy that capital. But I, I really want the regulator to rule on stable coins. Now, you know that there's been some controversy. So, so as you see here, let me pause that one. Um, as you see, I mean, O'Leary has been championing stable coins, especially USDC for quite some time. And he's right. There, there are uh, scenarios that play into this that really could leverage in major capital into the space. Primarily, though, what I think this would do is would, is would really shore up the positions in terms of crypto quick deployment. As you guys know, being able to quick deploy off of a stable coin into a market is very easy as opposed to if you're uh, out there trading, trying to get cash into your exchanges or getting cash converted into exchange so you can get it into a token for DeFi, whatever that might be uh, that helps you guys go in that direction. I think USDC and other stable coins go in this direction, BUSD, Tether, et cetera, really kind of solve that big solution. Now, his, his take here of um, a protection or a hedge against inflation is kind of curious in the sense that the value of a stable coin does not necessarily go up or down, true, the question I would have is maybe he's thinking in the sense of when uh, your value of a, a stable coin is, you know, X, always will be X, um, you know, providing it doesn't depeg, and the opportunity for you to be able to deploy that in either lower uh, capital assets when they drop uh, and be able to kind of leverage up against that. Maybe that's the angle in which he's kind of going because otherwise it has a lot of similarities to the U.S. dollar. Uh, as an overall scenario. Some of the things that are happening uh, around the states, though, you've got New York, which is kind of interesting. They are now uh, demanding Tether to prove USDT backing. And this has been a scenario that's been in the news for quite some time. And not only just in Tether's uh, you know, resources in terms of their balance sheet, but the fact that we're starting to see this in New York. Remember, New York is still one of the biggest states in the country that have active crypto investors, uh, mainly I think because of the demographic makeup there. Uh, New York City is still one of the biggest. Uh, Chicago is still a larger Miami, uh, obviously in Los Angeles. Those are the big cities that, that really kind of flow into uh, crypto as a whole. And when you look even at our own audience demographic here on the show is we see a lot of that. But back to this article, uh, I was brought to the light that U.S. judge in New York dismissed Tether's motion uh, blocked by the release of its financial rest records. Therefore, the New York now has to produce um, the network, excuse me, now has to produce an array of documents pertaining to the backing of USDT. This list includes general ledgers, balance sheets, income statements, etc. This is going to be a big deal for Tether. My question will be, will they actually comply with the state of New York um, or will there be a continued uh, offset of this until they get down to some sort of audit? Because this is kind of going past the audit layer and into the actual books and records of uh, the organization. So I think this is a big one. Uh, when we look at how this might play out in the coming in the coming months, the other one that we talked about yesterday uh, was Robinhood. Robinhood lists uh, USDC as first stablecoin on the trading platform. Uh, as as I understand, I haven't checked the Robinhood accounts yet, and I believe from CryptoPit they were saying that you can 
uh, send and receive there. Yesterday it was only buy, but I think send and receive is either ready or in some accounts or close to being uh, ready within the Robinhood uh, pack. Now, the scenario with Robinhood knowing this yesterday, or releasing this, I should say, I mean, it just feels like this is, there's a lot of insider stuff going on. I'm not claiming there's anything inside going on with Robinhood. What I'm saying is they get access to information from Capitol Hill, from the regulators, from uh, DC, from the Wall, Wall Street insiders, whatever you want to call it. These people know what's up. And I think for the fact that it's starting to get a little obvious that they're releasing this stuff uh, right before something like this gets bro broke out in terms of media. And then boom, you've got Robin Hood really right there in, uh, right there in line in terms of PR lining up with um, this regulation. So uh, listed circle uh, USD coin, USDC earlier today, uh, first stable coin available to retail traders on its platform. Uh, move obviously signals an increase in focus on crypto trading as part of Robinhood's business model. And this also, I think, will push them into the eventual uh, evolution of a DeFi wallet, which really is the very specific issue. If you go on to read, it says our vision with crypto is obviously one of the, be tr you know, the most trusted platform out there uh, and its roadmap uh, into the decentralized web. This was coming from uh, Robinhood's team. According to the firm's earnings, Note, uh, customers also tell us they want to introduce more coins onto the platform. This, I think, is just something that will happen with Robinhood. Now, again, remember that the Robinhood demographic has a lot of similarities to the emerging demographics of where growth is coming from uh, in the crypto space, and that is the younger millennials and even Gen Zs to a certain extent. So we're seeing a lot more of this uh, definitely starting to move in the direction of adoption. And then also with Robinhood, I think they'll get a chance to play into the game of, you know, not necessarily the Wall Street bets crowd, but a very similar demographic to that. Will it be the institutionals going there? No, but it will be uh, a large percentage of the masses, especially the emerging investors going into Robinhood. So I think it's a good play. It's going to be a good play and it will segue into a very strategic and important thing for Robinhood, which is going to be a, um, a DeFi wallet. Uh, to me, of course, revised the call for 2022 stable regulation. This was kind of the indicator right here. Let me zoom in on this. Um, he's a top Republican on the Senate Banking Committee. He also said that he believes Congress can get together on a bill that would at least prevent or re uh, a repeat of the Terra Luna collapse. Uh, that happened in May. And then obviously we saw a lot of, uh, you know, kind of bank run uh, approaches on that, which I think this is a good effort, and this is the scenario, and it's it's good to me in the sense does my heart well to see our regulators maybe actually understanding what's happening in this space, and I think Toomey is one of those guys that really understands where this is going. Further in the article it says the fact that there was a sort of sensational bad event did move uh, this up the list, so obviously the Terra Luna thing, kind of a you know silver lining here, but a bit put a, put it on a lot of people's radar that didn't have it on their radar, which again, I think this is, you know, bad events, bad actors always bring it up. Uh, and we do get these congressional pushes for sure. And he says that he thinks there's still a chance to get stable coin legislation done this year. And I think the administration would like to get something done. And I think this would, this would be interesting because this would bode well for the Biden administration. If they are able to pull something off like this, it is one, it really, I think, is going to hit on the Republican sector. So I think you'd get some bipartisan support. And it also is going to help on the center Democrats because of the fact that this is going to go into more capitalism uh, proposed scenarios. And I think even though there are scenarios that kind of play into that, this is a very uh, interesting model that I think uh, D.C. is in the midst of uh, dealing with. Further into this, now you've got, uh, coming over from the block, you've got Revolut, who is now expanding uh, U.S. crypto offering, adding 29 tokens, including Doge. Uh, now, Revolut, if you know uh, much about them, they're a European neobank or uh, internet digital bank. There are several of those out there uh, in the market like this. I mean, here in the U.S., you've got, you know, things like, um, you know, Ally. You've got the, there's one up in um, Portland uh, that's been moving. Uh, but Ally is kind of like one of the bigger ones. And then you've got a handful of others that are starting to develop, but don't necessarily have a lot of deposits yet. So I think Revolut is going to be an early leader 
uh, in here uh, for sure. It's going to expand its uh, crypto investments, adding 29 tokens. This is part of a wider expansion in crypto services for its American customers uh, with crypto deposits and withdrawals and staking tokens in the pipeline. So this is all coming. It's all coming to banks. And I want you guys to be aware of this. These kinds of banks, especially these neo banks, um, this is going to be, I believe, going to be the future of how financial systems will be operated globally. Sure, there will be brick and mortar and click and mortar type banks out there for quite some time, but the the ones that are really going to start to grow, remember the type of audience that they're gearing up to. They're gearing up to millennials and Gen Z. And I want you to think through that for a second, because remember, millennial audience, very large. Uh, granted, the boomer audience, still the largest depositors in the history of mankind. Uh, Gen X, a small seg- sub-segment, but very wealthy. Um, but the up-and-coming markets, which I think over the next 10 to 20 years, this is where we're going to see it, and it's all going to be driven through this kind of uh, demographic, which is going to be huge for this. And of course, obviously, stable coins will play into this, especially if we start to see banks going in this direction. So a really, uh, a really good thing, I think, here overall. One of the things I wanted to kind of draw attention to this, going full crypto, uh, the move offers such features as uh, represents a broader push into digital assets. Uh, they're, they're valued at like $33 billion right now. Uh, but for, further all, the company still is into some regulatory headwinds. This is going to be the thing that they have to get through with a lot, especially here in the United States, with a lot of the banking rules and regulations that kind of apply to traditional banking uh, here. And it is tough to get a banking license. And that is one of the things I think that will benefit. But again, if they're really pushing heavy into crypto, it's going to be one of those that kind of move in this direction. Don't push past where Robinhood could be going in this direction as well. I still think Robinhood might actually end up being a bank someday. Here's another digital uh, neobank. This is FB, FB Bank, which has integrated USDC stablecoins for direct deposits. That's big. Uh, let me kind of zoom in on this one right here. They announced this uh, on Wednesday. Launch of new service allowance account holders to make direct deposits in USDC into the bank's uh, US dollar accounts. Uh, this feature enables customers to receive uh, USDC on their accounts, similar to traditional deposits like wire automated clearinghouse, ACH. And then the funds are instantly and automatically converted into U.S. dollars. Sounds very similar to what like things like um, Binance is doing with USDC, converting that automatically to BUSD. So interesting play here. New solution allows FB uh, users to send invoices to their international clients in USDC. Another big play uh, scenario. This will go head to head with uh, products out there like Coinbase Commerce because Coinbase Commerce obviously has an invoicing solution where enterprise companies are using that to basically use crypto as a tool in which they can get paid. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. I'm doing uh, courses right now here in our local community with business owners of how to set them up on things like this. So I think banks eventually will start rolling into this. Obviously, FV, uh, they are a Puerto Rican bank, um, but uh, it is an interesting move, I think. And it's going to be one that I think will start to flow in this direction around a lot of different regional banks as well as the bigger guys coming into it. Uh, And then they go on to state, uh, we believe this feature will be greatly enhance the user experience and open up more frictionless commerce. Totally agree with that. And then we've chosen USDC due to its licensing reserves uh, and real-time one-to-one liquidity. I still like USDC. I'm not opposed to it. I do uh, hold it. Um, It is one of those things I was a little worried about during the, you know, the Ethereum merge of how that ERC... 20 token, obviously it was a non-event, but uh, that is something that you kind of uh, had to pay attention to, and, and it was fine, no problems. And uh, the other aspect is liquidity uh, scenarios that play into this, especially when you have uh, two major exchanges like Binance and Wazirex kind of playing off of this and going into their own uh, scenarios. So I think that that may have a little bit of uh, pressure onto it. Could the new house uh, stablecoin bill kill Frax and die? And this will be a big one right here. The new bill is seeking to place a two-year ban on uh, indigenously collateralized stablecoins, meaning there's something else that's going against it. So the stablecoin bill will make it illegal to issue or or create stablecoins that mimic the functionality. We talked about this earlier. Uh, But it would prohibit the stablecoin market as being uh, being able to convert it or redeem, etc. Into another digital asset. So I think these are are good moves. And the fact that they're well-versed on 
how this may play out to me is a good sign for the industry. Further in the article, it says protocols such as Frax Finance have uh, so far successfully utilized a mixed collateral collateralization method. And then um, the new stablecoin uh, bill will recognize the differences remain to be seen. So this is still up in the air. It, it's a short period of time. I think this is good. Another concern regarding the new bill, how it might affect other things like MakerDAO's uh, DAI stablecoin, which is unlike iron and frax. DAI is completely co collateralized by exogenous uh, assets. So that one is most likely going to be affected. Um, and then, but it is collateralized by USDC and ETH. So interesting of how this will kind of be, because there may be some uh, exclusions within this based on, because it's a complicated scenario right now, and they haven't, I think regulators in general, have not necessarily seen these kind of scenarios, especially in the financial side of things. So I think they are ahead of themselves in the sense that they at least recognize what's happening in the marketplace, and they're starting to move in a direction of some sort of regulatory guidance, which is exactly what the market needs. So big one for sure. The other thing that happens is when uh, bear markets start to really produce, uh, we start to see a lot of people flood back into either cash or stables. And this article right here, bearish crypto market sentiment sends investors back into stable coins. Listen, this is what I have done. You know, whenever I feel like we, it, when I look at, at projects, because I still hold a large amount of crypto, but they're holding accounts. They're accounts that I know are going to be held for a long time. But the liquid that I've done on trades Instead of pushing back into the market, I've been pushing that into stablecoins. So it's just a strategy I've been using. And I think we're going to see more of this uh, around, uh, especially around the market as we start to see more pushes down uh, in the market. And I still think we're going to see some pretty big moves in an opportunity in a very short period of time, which will do one thing, push more into stablecoins, which are U.S. dollar backed. So think about that. Global inflation also is mounting and stablecoins are helping protect savings. Now, there are some aspects to this that I think play into this. The counterinflation approach um, has also strengthened the value of the U.S. dollar. We know how much it's grown against the euro um, due to tight dollar liquidity checks. Uh, as 79.5% of all international trades now are using the dollar, many countries are now paying for premium imports to compensate. So you think about that. If they had, let's say, a European... Uh, customer or person or individual enterprise had put all their euros into stablecoin. That would essentially be a one for one. They would not have any kind of offset there as they're holding a euro. So to me, uh, the currencies that are underperforming the US dollar are the ones that really could benefit from uh, using stable or companies benefit from using stable coins as opposed to their currency for fiat. Uh, with the U.S. dollar recording steep appreciation against other fiat currencies, most crypto savvy have special interest in holding in stable coins. Hence the point. Uh, and I think this is going to be uh, huge because, again, it goes back into speed, liquidity, uh, and access, and being able to move large sums, which is still, I, you know, it's one of the things that gets me about the traditional fiat system. And an example if you're going in and, and, and trying to purchase anything that's a large ticket item, typically you've got to go let your bank know what's going on because it's like, you know, fraud alerts start going off. Everything just gets crazy because the fraud systems are so rampant within the fiat and banking system. When you do this within crypto, there's so many uh, counter checks and blockchain elements in here in terms of security measures. That it, you know, for most transactions, it's so much more fluid and easy and simple. And uh, one example I saw recently was I helped set a, a business up and they were utilizing, they have high ticket items and they were utilizing um, ACH and wire transfers, all these different things that were taking hours, days, sometimes to re resolve. We flipped them on uh, with USDC. Immediately they started seeing this uh, in use case. And in fact, they started seeing increase in sales. So enterprise applications businesses are going to start looking at this more and more and I think banks have to go in this direction so a lot happening now you go jump over to this story right here and I think uh, Brian Armstrong is dead on on his point here and it says basically Coinbase CEO says crypto regulation is now a national security issue the basis of the story is this is that what Armstrong is saying is that if we don't get this underway we are going to see this offshore. 
We're going to see this being developed in countries like Middle East, uh, Middle East countries in the Eastern Bloc, countries in Asia that are going to grow in a financial ecosystem in which we are hind, kind of hand-strapped and in a position where we're at a disadvantage in terms of innovation and creativity being created around these markets, especially around the innovation of where all this is going. And if you look at his last statement right here, let me kind of zoom up on this for you guys. Over time, we want to help crypto candidates solicit donations from crypto community and crypto. And then we'll also expand to get more geographic coverage in global elections and add data various candidates running for office, not just currently elected officials. This to me is a huge shot across the bow in really helping candidates because regulation is going to be critical, but even more so candidates that actually understand what's happening in crypto is going to be critical to the next generations. And I think all this is definitely going to be moving in that direction for sure. All right, guys, listen up. Uh, make sure and hit the like uh, the like button. It's one of the ways we get feedback from you guys. We love it when you get to, when you guys do that. And of course, stick around for our live stream because we're going to be coming on here in a few minutes with the FOMC uh, meeting. Uh, we'll get a chance to hear Chair Powell. Likely, we're going to see a 75 basis points. But the more important thing, this is possibly one of the most critical FOMC meetings of the year. Reason being. We've seen a lineup of fairly sharp interest rate increases. We also will not have another FOMC until November, post-election. And we've seen uh, some pretty deep cuts in inflation and continuing problems from the global macro. What Powell is about to say is going to be critical over the next few months for crypto. And I think in general, the markets, which we'll continue to see, a lot of that stuff. So make sure and stay tuned over there. I know we might have a poll coming in. Let me take a look here. All right. Will we see a stable coin uh, bill introduced or passed before November 8th? 62% are no. Hmm. This would have to really spin through Congress. I, I kind of feel that there is a yes on that. Um, only because, and again, this is, you know, I understand, you know, the financial uh, house committee, they, they do move slowly. I mean, you got Maxine Waters that kind of is the head of that. And um, in general, it's a somewhat bipartisan group. That would be the advantage of it. The other thing is, I still think this is a, it's an easy win. Uh, it's been asked for, it's been uh, being researched for quite some time. Uh, Biden's already initiated the discovery evidence that he needs to be able to start moving in the direction and giving direction to different organizations and regulators, as well as an understanding of what's happening in the space from his recent research parlay. So I think this could actually play into the Democrats' hand. And if it could play in the Democrats' hands, that might happen before November. So this will be interesting to watch uh, and very close. Again, this will also play into what's happening here on the FOMC meeting. Coming up in just about... Uh, 30 minutes to an hour. So we'll be start, we'll start streaming it around two o'clock. So make sure and hit the notify button on our YouTube channel. Uh, you guys can go over there and catch all that. If you're catching this uh, after the live stream, listen, the best way to catch this kind of alpha and the information, the research that's poured into this channel is to jump in as a subscriber, like a few videos and hit the subscribe button. The one thing you do want to do is click the bell uh, and you have to kind of make sure if you already subscribed, double check that you are still subscribed. And then also that you're on the notify, because if you put always notify, um, it's going to always give you a, a, a bump when we get ready to go live. So all that good stuff, you guys know how to use YouTube. But for those of you, you know, sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's just a good reminder. If you haven't joined into the Diamond Circle, make sure and jump into that. It's our free solution out there and it's easy to do. And of course, um, we drop a couple of emails a week uh, there on the Diamond Circle. So it's, uh, it's, it's really a good uh, service. Of course, if you guys want to catch me, it is out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.